Well, I am pleased um, to introduce Michael, the E3 TKI. And Michael, I borrowed everything that I learned about you from your QRZ page. So I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Michael was li has been licensed since January 1992 after having wanted to become a ham since he was a teenager. And as I alluded to earlier, the most interesting part of the hobby for him is HFDXing. So as an active DXer, he has, his DXCC totals are currently 306 entries worked with 306 entries confirmed. Uh, he wants to let us know that he does subscribe to the DX code of conduct. Lots of topics in here all by themselves. He is a member of Radio Amateurs of Canada, which is our national radio um, organization. He's a member, an active member of the Mississauga Amateur Radio Club and a member of the Mississauga ARES group. He also belongs to the Peel Amateur Radio Club Homebrew Group. And it has an interest there in learning through designing and building homebrew RF circuits. Some of you may know him as the president and bureau manager of the VA3 VE3 incoming QSL card bureau and one of the mailing volunteers for the incoming VE3 two letter calls. So you, got, you get all my cards, the few that have come around. It's my pleasure um, to introduce Michael, who's going to come and talk to us about Smith charts and, and the basics around that, because we all want to get a better signal going out and, and enhance our propagation and enhance what our, our setup, our stations can do and our antennas can do and everything. So without any other further ado, Michael, thank you for coming and joining our club tonight. And I'll turn the microphone over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you, that's a pretty nice introduction, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, gonna set myself up for, uh, and I gotta go to, uh, oh, wait a second, I gotta do it the other way. Uh, just a sec, I gotta go back and find, sorry about this. I guess I gotta go share the screen first, I think. Okay, looks good. So you should see the Smith chart first page, right? Okay, another page? No, no other page. Uh-oh, <laughs> just a second. It looks like we're seeing your PowerPoint uh, That's right. Not in presentation mode. We're just saying PowerPoint as you yeah, can see I'm it. Trying to set it into presentation mode there. Yep, that looks great. Okay, right. you see the second page? We do, yes. Okay. So, um, okay, this is about Smith charts, which I guess you all know. Um, and uh, the reason I got into this was, uh, as, as was said, I'm a member of the Homebrew Group, the Peel Homebrew Group, and I foolishly volunteered to learn about Smith charts. And uh, that's why this presentation, because I've given it to the, uh, to the, uh, the Homburg group and nobody laughed. So I guess it's all right. Anyway, um, so this is really getting into the weeds, this stuff. So what I'm gonna talk about is some of the basic concepts of what it's all about and why you would use Smith charts. Uh, there's an example I've got <clears throat> with a, a load that I built. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cable length measurement um, and how you use the Smith chart to look at that kind of stuff. And the input impedance is really what that's all about, figuring out what the input impedance is. If you connect a load, that should be line, not line, connect a load to, uh, to a transmission line, what's the impedance of the other end of the line? And there's a program called Smith, Sim Smith that I'm gonna talk about as well. So to start with, what is a Smith chart? What it is, it's a graphical method of looking at transmission line problems. Um, this is before the time that the Smith charts were, the guy by the name of Smith, surprisingly, invented or developed the Smith chart idea in the early 30s, 1930s. And what it is, it allows you to take a complicated transmission line problem, which you'd otherwise have to calculate mathematically to get something, um, turn it into a very simple graphical process, which I'm going to talk about. And you use it to, to do things like plotting complex impedance, resistance, and capacitance, or inductors, 
uh, complex reflection coefficients, which I'll get into in a minute, analyzing the effects of transmission lines, and developing mag matching networks. When you have a load at the end of a line, the impedance is not always what you want it to be. How do you fix that? So it makes this complicated process simple graph graphically. And of course, at the time the Smith's Hearts were developed, um, uh, there, were, there was no computer simulations and the like. And before I go on much further, I need to say that um, a lot of the slides and whatnot, that I'm the stuff that I'm talking about here, I've shamelessly plagiarized from various different places. Uh, a really good source of information is Al Wolke, W2, WA2EW. Um, he has a wealth of information on transmission lines and the nano DNA and the like. And he's done a couple of presentations on Smith charts, which I've uh, plagiarized from. So a lot of the stuff comes from him. I haven't, I haven't done it myself. So at the, at the top of the screen here, this is what a transmission line looks like. There's a load at the right-hand side be it an antenna or whatever, let's say it's an antenna, and it's and and the transmission line is represented by its characteristic impedance Z0. Usually, well, it can be 50 ohms, it can be 450, whatever. And if you put a source at the left-hand end of that transmission line, you get a, a wave that goes, uh, a RF wave that goes down the line, the incident wave gets to the load at the end and if the load is not matched to the transmission line impedance Z0, you get a reflection coming back. So there's a very complicated formula for calculating the impedance at any point in that line, and that's the equation underneath the diagram. It's got the, it's got the characteristic impedance Z0, it's got the load impedance itself, it's got the tangent of beta times length, where beta times length is the electrical distance down the line, you know, it's a, it's a nightmare to calculate, let alone plot. And there's another, so it's difficult to, to plot that kind of stuff on a, on a rectangular coordinate uh, piece of paper, graph paper with resistance and react on one, uh, on one axis and reactants on the other. There's a thing called the reflection coefficient, which is the, you can see on the diagram, it's the ratio of the voltage wave that's reflected back to the incident voltage wave. So if you think about it, if if um, if there's no reflection coming back, then that's that's uh, zero, and that's a perfect match. Um, it can be any in any number of different values. So that represents the degree of matching, if you like. So at the bottom, it's calculated as the reflected voltage divided by incident voltage, and you can do some mathematical gyrations and come up with the formula involving the load impedance and the Z zero. And the bottom line is it's a complex number. So it's got a real component that shows up on the horizontal axis of a, of a, of a diagram. And it's got a, an imaginary component that shows up on the vertical axis. And those are the, uh, so that's the, that's the formula for the reflection, re reflection coefficient. And what a Smith, Smith chart is, is really a plot of the reflection coefficient. That's really what it amounts to. And um, you can show that if you take this formula and manipulate it, you can show that the real part um, is turns into circles, resistance circles, if you like, and the reactance parts turns into arcs on the diagram. So let's go on a bit. So as we just said, let me get my pointer going here. Uh, yeah, so this is the real axis on a, this rectangular coordinate line. This is the vertical axis, the reactance axis. Uh, an impedance that <clears throat> constant resistance on this shows up as a vertical line here. And a constant reactance co in contrast shows up as a horizontal line. Conceptually, you can take this diagram on the left and sort of bend the axes. So, so you bend the positive x axis around to the right like this. And you take the negative x-axis and you turn it to the right like this. And you end up with circles and arcs when you do that. <clears throat> There's another way to look at it. Here's the, uh, so the imaginary part of the reactant, the positive part ends up looking on the right hand, on the top part of the circle. And uh, the, negative, the negative reactants on the bottom, the resistances are, are circles. 
again, this 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 axis is the real part of the reflecting reflection quotient on the horizontal axis and the imaginary part on the vertical. You can do the same thing with admittances. Admittances are the an admittance is the reciprocal of the impedance. So if an impedance is R plus Jx, or an impedance, then the admittance is G plus JB. And G is called the conductance, and B is called the susceptance. And you can see on the left hand side, there's there's the conductance and the real part, and here's the susceptance part here. So notice that it's on the left-hand side, the circles are on the left, where on the other diagram, they're on the right. So another way to look at it, the inductive, positive inductance uh, impedances are above, and the capacitance impedances are below the horizontal line, which at which point the reactance is zero. So this is a pure resistance along here. And these circles here, the red ones, um, this is all you got here, my, the, the red ones are, constant resistance circles. And in the middle here, somewhere in here is the sort of origin of this diagram. So here's some resist constant resistance circles. The further, further to the right you go, the larger the resistance. And this is R prime because what you do is you take the impedance in ohms and you divide it by the characteristic uh, impedance, which would be 50 ohms normally. And so the constant, so that if, if there's, if the, if it's 50 ohms, it falls, the, it falls on this circle. So it's always one and so on. And the smaller resistance is to the left. So here's some constant reactance arcs. When you go through this calculation and you plot, you take your, your impedance and you plot the real part, the resistance part on the constant resistance circles and you plot the reactive part on these arcs. And the arcs you'll notice all go to the end, to the edge of the diagram here. And around the side, it's marked the value of that normalized reactance. So you went around, you follow this one, you'd find that's 0.5. You follow this one, you'd find it's one. And the circles here, well, in the middle, you can see one right here. You go this way, they're higher. Two or three is probably over here, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, and whatnot this way. And the other thing about this Smith chart while I'm here is that around the outside edge, there's wavelengths marked, wavelengths towards the generator, towards the source end of the, of the diagram, the, the circuit. And the other way is towards the load. And if you go all the way around, you'll notice if you take any particular point here and you say this one, and you go all the way around the, the circle, all the way around, well, let's take a look at the outside. If you start here and you go all the way around the circle, you're gonna end up back here with the same impedance. So these impedances um, repeat as you go around this, as, as you go around the Smith chart. That becomes relevant later. So an open circuit, infinite resistance here. A short circuit is here, zero resistance here. And this is the middle. This is the this is the uh, the 50 ohm impedance divided by the if it's 50 ohms, characteristic impedance one right here. So one of the things about Smith charts is that it turns out that as a, a, if you follow, if you take a, take a particular point on this circ, on this diagram here, let's say, and you add impedance to that point through a transmission line, those impedances all fall on this on, on a circle. And that circle um, has a constant reflection ratio, but also a constant SWR, which means, by the way, that if you if you have a load and you you add transmission a transmission line to the load, a piece of coaxial cable, then the impedance at the end of that cable changes, but the standing wave ratio inside the cable is always the same for reasons I won't attempt to explain. So there's a couple of different types of Smith charts. There's the impedance only Smith chart, which is this one, the black and white one. And there's another one that has admittance on it as well. So the red stuff on this diagram is impedance. And these, arc, these arcs here are the reactance arcs and the circles are in here. 
There's also um, the admittance stuff, which is blue. And the blue circles on this side are, are uh, conductance, the real part of the admittance. And the arcs, the blue arcs, are the imaginary part, the reactive part, if you like, of the admittance. And again, it's marked around the side. So you can follow an arc around the side and get the normalized admittance just as you can with a reactance on the side. That turns out to be really handy. The other thing at the bottom of the chart, there's some, there's some graphs here. And uh, one of them is, is the SWR graph, which is kind of handy. So you can, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but you can, you can take a Smith chart, look at where your impedance is, plot it on the, on the chart, and you can figure out what the standing rate ratio or the return loss or whatever you want by just using these scales on the bottom, very handy. So I started out to, when I was looking at this, I want to understand it. So I built myself, basically, it's basically a, a, a load. It's a 33 ohm resistor, I think, and a 204 picofarad capacitor here. And it's in series, they're connected in series here. This is an SME connector and uh, I use SME stuff to do this. So that's why. So, you can plot the load impedance on the Smith chart. And that, of course, Z is R plus JX. And if it's a capacitor, it's R plus JX C for the capacitor reactance, which ends up being a negative value because it's a, a capacitance rather than an inductor. The load I picked here was 33 ohms. Capacitor is 220 picofarads. These are nominal values. 33 ohms is roughly, I think, sort of roughly what a quarter wave vertical antenna impedance looks like, the real part, roughly. So anyway, that ends up, when you calculate the um, reactance for the capacitor, this value of capacitor, you get 33 minus J51. That's in ohms. Uh, I took nominal values out of my toolkit, my box of stuff, if you like, and that's what I used. So it comes out 33 minus J51. What I did, I used the nano VNA. I don't know if you guys, have, some of you may have seen the nano VNA, which is a really handy little tool. I actually plot, or actually measured it with the VNA and I got 33.43 and the, the capacitance was 221 versus, or 224 versus 220, close enough. So anyway, I normalize, you normalize that. So you divide everything by the characteristic impedance, which is 50 ohms for most of us. So this Z load is the actual Z divided by 50, which ends up being 0.66 minus J1.02. And there's no units in this anymore because it's ohms divided by ohms. So then what you do is you plot this load on the Smith chart and you put it at the intersection of the constant R circle for this particular R, 0.6, so you find the 0.66 circle. And then you, then you find the arc corresponding, the X corresponding to minus 1.02, which is the, the bottom half of the chart. So you plot the R, you plot them on the red resistance circle and the red reactant circle. And like I said before, the admittance is the reciprocal of the impedance and it's on the blue conductance circle and the blue susceptance arc, and that value is this, 0.45 plus J.69, when you calculate it, just by inverting it. Well, here's my diagrams, and they get kind of, I'm really disappointed in the ability to do a really good Smith chart diagram on PowerPoint, but anyway. So when I, on the diagram, I plotted, this, this here is the, resistance, this is the 0.66 resistance circle, this one going right around here. And this arc here is the 1.02 reactance arc. And you can find on here, you can find 1.02. And on the circles, the resistance values are marked on the circles. And 0.66 is to the, to the left of the, the 1, r equals 1 which circle, which is right here. <clears throat> and so you can, you can find your value on these, you can find the value of the cir resistance circle by looking on the diagram, it's there marked. You can also take the arc for the 
you can put your point, you can look down here on the resistance, the reactance arc rather, and find the 1.02. That's how you do it. And this is the constant SWR circle, which is really handy because what you can do is you can draw a, you can draw a radius from the center of the circle here to this, and you basically swing around the circle. It's all constant SWR. And when you get to the horizontal axis, you can draw a perpendicular down here on, on this scale, lo and behold, is the SWR, which was uh, 3 point something, 3.8 roughly. And you can get return loss and stuff. And this is a bigger diagram so you can see better what I'm talking about. Here's the, here's the, re the reactance arc. Here's the circle, um, R equals 0.66. You take your, you take your center of your circle and you draw your, you, you make an arc, you follow around the radius here till you get to the horizontal line, you drop down and you get the SWR. So that's how you plot an impedance on a, on a Smith chart. So now I want to talk a bit about cables. And uh, what I did, I had a, I had a piece of RG58, RG8U rather. Um, it's around 30 feet long, I thought. So I measured it with a tape measure to get the accurate measurement, and it came out at 30.3 feet, 9.24 meters. But one of the things you can do with an with a nano VNA is you can determine the length of a transmission line. So when I did that, um, I had to adjust what's known as the velocity factor of the cable. Uh, the typical velocity factor for RG8U is 0.78. And when, you, when I looked at my cable, it told me on the, on the nano VNA here, it told me that it was, it was larger quite a bit larger than the 9.24 meters I had measured. So what I did, I you can adjust the velocity factor that the nano VNA uses to calculate their length. And I had to adjust it to 0.74, which is sort of within the within the tolerance of the of the cable. So it's typically 0.78, but this is pretty close. And when you do that, when you adjust the velocity factor, you get to the point where the nano VNA tells you the real length, 9.24. And what the nano VNA does, by the way, it's um, you set it up to trans. It basically there's a function here called the transform function. It, it basically sends a signal out through the antenna connection, which is here, this one, and it measures the time for that signal to come back. And that's how they tell the length of the cable. So it gives you the length right here on the, on the diagram. So um, what I did, I measured the length of the cable with a tape measure. Then I calculated what it should have been, as I just said, with the, uh, with the velocity factor. Typical one gave me the wrong number, so I adjusted the factor to get 9.24. Now I know I've got the <clears throat> nano VNA set up properly. So what's the wavelength? Uh, I was using a frequency of 14.20 megahertz. So one wavelength in free space is 300 divided by the frequency, which comes out to 21.13 meters here. But the length in the cable, because the cable is not in a vacuum or open air, it, the velocity factor is not one, it's less than that. So the electrical length of the cable is less. So one wavelength in the cable is 15.63 meters long. <clears throat> so that means the length of the cable in wavelengths is 9.24, its physical length divided by the divided by the uh, the electrical length of 15.62, in other words, 0 0.591, a little bit more than half a wavelength long in the cable. So what you do to plot your input impedance at the end at the end of the cable is you firstly calculate the, that's a phone ringing by the way, fake number. You first start, sorry about that. You first start out by plotting, plotting the impedance on your diagram, which is 0.66 minus J1.02 on the Smith chart as we just done. Then what you do is you draw a constant SWR circle through that impedance. And then you, know, you 
one one uh, one rotation on the on the Smith chart all the way around is half a wavelength. So we've got sort of that. So we've got 0 0.5 0 0.591. So that's a little that's one complete rotation around the chart, half a wavelength, and a little bit extra, the 0 0.091. So you use the you use the chart to plot where that impedance is, and it shows up as the impedance is 0.34 minus j.29 on the Smith chart. So it shows up right on the Smith chart. So I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but that's that's how you figure out um, what you got. Then, uh, yeah, then what you do is um, this is the diagram here. So here's our starting impedance, 0.648. And one complete rotation around is half a wavelength. So all the way around this way to the generator, to the, to the source, and back here is half a wavelength. But I've got a bit more than that, I've got an extra 0 0.091. And when you follow around here, that's what you get in terms of the load impedance. So the load should have been 0 0.34. It should be 0 0.34 minus J.29. And uh, let me go back here. Let me go back one. So when you actually do that, you get this 0 0.34 minus J.29. Actually, that's so that is the impedance of the beginning of the, the beginning of this cable. It's 9.24 meters long. <clears throat> you can also use the nano VNA to measure that. And it shows right when you set it up properly, it shows up as 16.64 ohms and a, a capacitance of 750 picofarads, 756. And when you calculate that out, it comes out to 0.33 minus J.29, pretty close. So essentially the same as what's on the chart. So that's how you do that. The other thing you can do, one of the other things you can do with a Smith chart, and I, I pointed that that's going back to the, uh, the transmission line link, that's a really easy way to find out what you're gonna get at the end of your transmission line in terms of impedance without actually going and laying out a piece of cable on your, uh, on your floor and measuring it with some kind of meter. This is an easy way to do it. The other thing you can do is you can do impedance matching. <clears throat> and what you do to do that is you choose a, a topology um, consisting of uh, resistor, res resistance, cap uh, capacitance, or inductor, inductor combinations. <coughs> and there's various different topologies you can use. You can have series or, or uh, parallel capacitance. You can have series or parallel inductances. Likewise, you can have series or parallel resistances. So what you do is you, you and there's, there's, depending on what you pick, you get different acceptable, acceptable, if you like, impedances on the Smith chart. And this is, this is for, this the white here is for a parallel inductor, inductor is in parallel with the load and a, in a, a series capacitance. And at the end here, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to transform your load impedance, which is the 33 plus J whatever, you're trying to transmit, change change that into 50 plus J zero, which is a matched 50 ohm uh, impedance, 50 ohms with no reactance. It's, it's, so that's what you want to do. So what you do is you start at, you start at the load and you, you add these capacitance and inductances in the particular way you want to do it, and you end up hopefully with 50 plus J zero. So as an example, this is the same impedance I was using before, and I want to end up with 50 plus J0 here. And the, the way to do that, one way to do it, is to take an a inductor in parallel, parallel with the load and a, a capacitor in series. There's some other options. You can, if, the way you think about this, if, if it's just a series inductor, um, as you increase the inductance, the, re, the uh, reactance on the Smith chart goes this way. Um, likewise, if you have a capacitor in series, if a series capacitor instead of the inductor, and you increase the capacitance, the capacitance the thing goes this way. And likewise, with parallel inductances, uh, you now you're looking at the the conductance, the in, the admittance of the thing. And so the if you increase the in, in inductive reactance in parallel, it's going to go this way. And you increase the 
parallel impedance is going to go this way, parallel capacitance. So that's just a quick diagram. So what you do, you want to get you want to get to one plus j zero from your whatever it happens to be in a normalized. But yeah, so you want to get to there. So what you do is you put a capacitor, you put an inductor in parallel with the load, and what that means is you're moving along a constant conductance circle, and that's because there's just there's just the inductor involved. There's no other, no real part of the component. And if you had add a series capacitor, you're moving along a constant resistance circle. So what you do is you, I'm going to go on here. You start where your load is here. And you say, OK, it's 0.66 minus J1.02. I want to end up with 1 plus J0. So the first thing, with a resistance of 1 to start with. So the first thing you do is you put your parallel inductor in the circuit. And you find out how long this distance is on this blue constant conductance circle. You find out how far that is to get from where you are on the diagram to where you want to be on the constant resistance circle, which the R equals one, which is part way to where you want to be. You want to be down here. So you get first thing you do is you go up here and you you know you have to be here on the constant, the R equals one circle. And you measure the length of this arc in terms of conductance down here. You follow this conductance arc down here to get your starting point, And you follow this conductance conducting arc here. Yes, this one to get your ending point, your end point. So in this particular example, the change in susceptance, the B part of the admittance is 0.69 plus to get to here from here, plus another 0.5 to get up here. So it's 1.19. So you know that. And now you're sitting on the resistance circle here, the correct resistance circle, because it's the R equals 1. And you figure out how far you have to go from here down to the 1 plus J0, the 50 ohm match, in terms of adding a capacitance. And you measure this distance again. And this time, you're going from the red reactance arcs from this one down to here. So having done that, this is what it looks like in, in for better scale, you can see. We can see the, the conductance lines and whatnot better. So going back to this thing, we now know that the, 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 the size of the inductor we have to add has a, a, a susceptance of 1.19. So then you calculate the inductive reactance of that, and that comes out to 42 ohms. And then having done that, you put the 42 ohms into the standard formula for an inductor, which is the inductive reactance is equal to two times the frequency times the inductance. You put that into the formula and you calculate the inductance that you have to put in parallel with the load at for 14.2 megahertz. And it comes out to 0 0.74, 0 0.471 nanohenries. So that's the inductance you have to add in parallel with the load to match it. And now you do this, you've done the same thing with the capacitance. And you know that the, the change in capacitive reactance is 1.1 from the diagram again. So you calculate that out to be 1.1 times 50, which is 55 ohms. You stick that into your formula for the capacitance now, and you get a capacitance of 204 picofarads. So you now you know you need a 0 0.471 nanohenry inductor and a 204 picofarad capacitor. So what I did, I so to prove this to myself. I made up a little test board, and I wanted an, an inductor in parallel with the load, in other words, to ground, 471 nanohenries. So first thing I tried, I had a whole bunch of, of um, uh, T3743 inductor in uh, toroid cores, which are the little small ones that are about a quarter inch in diameter. I tried winding a, wind, uh, a, a coil around that, and I had like one turn. So that was useless. So I went to a bigger core, 80-6. About a half an inch in diameter, and it took eight turns. So I thought, oh, that's okay. 
I couldn't get the 471 because of the part turn. So I said, okay, I'll take, I'll take the eight turns, 484 nanohenries. And I measured it on an LC meter. So I knew that was right. Picked, I had a capacitor that was 204 picofarads. So I put that in series as well. And when I did that, um, I was able to measure the, the resistance ended up being 53.5 versus the 50. And I did this with the nano VNA and the reactants ended up being minus 1.72 ohms rather than the zero. So this is what the board looks like, a little test board I happen to have. Here's my, here's my load, the same load I used before. Uh, this goes to, a, the center conductor goes to a pad here. The coil is connected between that pad and ground here. And these are a bunch of capacitors that add up collectively to 204. Um, picofarads. So then I can put my meter on here and I can see what it does to the load, my nano VNA. So when I did that, this is, um, you get, the nano VNA is the, the, the small instrument I told you about where you can, there's a program called nano VNA saver that allows you to look on a, on a laptop at what, what you're doing. And, um, this point here, this one, is this marker one is up here. And here's the impedance, 53.5 minus J1.72. That's how I knew what it was, because I had used that <clears throat> test board with the load on it and whatnot, and that's what it came out to. So that's pretty well the end of it. I just want to talk a bit about this program called SimSmith, which is a really neat program you can use to simulate Smith chart stuff. So when you open up the uh, SimSmith program, you're faced with this diagram, which has the generator here, the source, you're, you're the end of your transmission line, if you like, and the green is the load here underneath here. <coughs> so you tell it the characteristic impedance and whatnot and the frequency you're dealing with. And then you can you can drag these things. So there's, there's let's see, there's um, where's an inductor? There is a, a parallel inductor. So you can drag that up onto your diagram here, and then you can drag a series capacitor. So I did that. And here you can see the, the load is now here. Sorry, the, the, the load is over here. This is the load we started with. And there's the 32.2 minus 50 ohms, J50. This is the parallel inductor that I added. And over here, you can see there's my starting point before I added anything. As soon as you add the parallel inductor, it moves this, the susceptance up to here, just like on the real Smith chart. And then you add the series capacitor here, and it moves the impedance back to here, back to one plus J zero, the, the completely matched circuit. So what you've done is you've taken your You've taken your, your load and you've matched it. So now you know if you put a transmitter at the end of that transmission line, transmitters require, they want 50 ohms. You're very close to 50 ohms here, you're pretty well exactly 50 ohms. So that's why you do this stuff. And you can do it on a, you can do it in SimSmith or you can do it on, uh, on the chart. And SimSmith is really powerful. I haven't used it a lot, but it's really good. So just as a, an example, another one here, this is the circuit, it's got the load, it's got a parallel inductor, that's here. It's got the series capacitor, that's this. It's got a parallel capacitor that goes this way and it's got a series inductor that takes you up here. And you can do the same thing with resistors as well. So that's sort of how it works. And uh, yeah, so where I got all this stuff, I started out saying I've shamelessly plagiarized. Uh, W2AW has a whole bunch of videos, one of which is on the Smith charts. And I talked to Al about using, he's, he has a number of presentations and I talked to him about basically just showing the presentation instead of doing myself. But it turns out to be easier to do it myself because that way I can hide behind what I don't know. And there's a bunch of other ones with the various different things. There's, a, there's a, a things about measuring coaxial cables with the nano DNA, which is another way to do it and matching stuff. And uh, there's a bunch of other papers. Anyway, so that's really all I have to say. So I'm gonna unshare here, I think. Yeah, so that's really all I have to say. Any questions, break that, whatever. Yeah.
if you have questions, go ahead. Or if there is multiple people, we'll try. Maybe I can, maybe I can leave now. Maybe I can leave now. <laughs> yeah, any questions? There seemed to be on the chart you were doing, um, you took a path. Uh, this is going to be hard to describe. Um, you took a path sort of like a quarter of the way around and up to the right and then back down and left. Um, it looked as though there would have been a shorter path to go less far around to the right and then back up and left. Let me go back to the chart. I'll go back. Hang on a sec. I, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Um, I assume the reason you couldn't is because that would require a really super tiny inductance or something completely impractical. That's right. But yeah, basically that's right. And uh, it, it's if, if you, um, yes, uh, let me just go back here. So you can go back. Can I share that? Can I yeah, share that? Share. Can't find the share thing. There it is. Yeah, let me just go back here. Um, yeah. Never mind, I won't. But yes, you that's, that's you. you can probably hit delete a few times or whatever you're back to. Here someplace, I just can't find it. But that that's exactly right. If you you got your choice. You can go you, in this particular case, I could have put a really tiny inductance and moved that impedance around from the starting point to the left a bit, and then put a series capacitor in and moved it up to the right, which would have taken me to the same place. But I didn't do that, and basically one of the reasons I didn't do it was because I was trying to duplicate what one of the uh, one of the articles had talked about doing. So that's why I did it that way. But you have a choice, and you can likewise you can use you can use a series capacitor, a series inductor, and a parallel capacitor, and it just does it differently. Same mm -hmm. idea. Depends what you pick. Two different circuits achieving the same results essentially. Well, same circuit, but you can. You can pick different components. You can take a series and you can take the different components and get the same way provided you pick the right topology, it works. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hello, Michael. Uh, how are you? It's Doug, VE3XDB. Uh, I just wanted to uh, know how you've used this practically um, in your own design, in your own work. Well, you were looking at it. <laughs> That's all I've done. I haven't actually used it. I uh, to do anything. I I have uh, an FT one thousand MP, and I have a, a mini quad up the top of a thirty nine feet up, and I've got my coax going up to my antenna switch, and uh, I rely on my antenna tuner to take care of me. So I actually haven't done this for real to match anything. I've just been experimenting. That's a neat experiment. Very, very uh, illustrative, that's for sure. Well, I thought it's kind of neat, actually. And, and uh, it's amazing what you can do with that uh, nano VNA. There's, there's um, you read up on it, you can do these kinds of things. You can measure transmission line lengths. You can do this kind of matching. You can, you can, you can see what an antenna tuner does to a signal because the nano VNA produces the signal itself and measures the results and you can do all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. Your SimSmith also had some, I want to say series and parallel open and closed lengths of coax on it, I, I spotted. Yes, that's right. Are you able to comment how those are affecting things and what those look like on the graphs or not? Well, what you what you apparently and I haven't done this, but there's a 150 page manual for the for the Simpsons program that's available online, so you can play with it. It's available free, by the way, online. The cool. program just download it. But yes, there's some there's some transmission line models there that basically look like a transmission line with a some kind of capacitance is either end, if I remember correctly, and. Uh, it models it models a, a piece of RG58 or something or RGAU. It would model it. You tell it, it must. Have, I haven't done it. You must be able to tell it the length and what cable it is, and it just does it. And then you put that into the circuit and you play with it if you have to. Cool. Yeah, because I know we've done something like that on field day occasionally when one of the stations needs essentially a null of the other stations. We've put a length of coax in there to essentially act as a filter. I just wondered what that looked like on the Smith chart. I'll play with the, the program. Cool, thanks. It's a good program, yeah. Thank you. John Vern just put the link in the chat for those who may want to go on and 
and take a look. Thanks, John. Any other comments or questions? Looks like not. Looks like no. Michael, I want to uh, thank you. Where I was going with it as I was listening to you talk was I've got a wonderful device in front of me called a T-Match, uh, an old manual homebrew antenna uh, transmatch system that has a coil, it has a capacitance. And what you describe really is what's happening is you turn those dials to adjust the for the SW appropriate SWR. And, and that for me, that was the application. And so I just understanding what I was doing as I set the the dial that adjusts the impedance and set the dial that adjusts the capacitance, whatever, as they're being as they are in um, put into the my antenna system and to help bring it down to the 50 ohm plus J zero. Yeah, that's what it does. Yeah, that's right. And actually Al Wilkie has one, has an, a YouTube video on that. It shows exactly that. And he sets up his antenna and he use, he shows what happens exactly like you're saying. So you were just, you showed us mathematically with the Smith chart, what, our antennas, although many of us, they're black boxes. We have no idea how they work, but we're glad they do. But I think that's helped. At least yeah. for, anyways, understand a little bit of what happens inside that antenna tuner in terms of what it's doing. Yeah, that's great. Physically. So I appreciate it. Thank you for coming and joining us. Oh, um, my pleasure. Uh, we do, we're grateful for taking your evening and, and being, joining with us. and. I think I speak for everyone who's who listened and stayed on and, and, and heard what you had to say that we're, we're grateful for this. Okay. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. I am we're at the end of the meeting. Our next meeting is April the 5th, again, 7:30 p.m. It will be here on Zoom. And I think I liked, and I was glad I was able to bring a couple of people in. We'll do a talk in on both RCK and KSR. So I think that helped bring some people in. In case you're wondering, we, we have two um, presentations happening. Um, because it's the month of, of April and we're just weeks away from the Waterloo Marathon, we're hoping Tony Lee from the Kitchen Waterloo St. John the Ambulance will be with us along with Nick, our own Nick VA3NNW and give us a bit of an orientation to our role in the Waterloo Marathon. It's been a number of years and we have a number of new people that have heard about this and have no idea what does a ham do to help support the Waterloo Marathon. So that's our plan. And we have John VE3 Echo Juliet who is coming um, to us from Contest Club Ontario and talking about the Contest Club Ontario, talking about his life in contesting. And that's in anticipation of our role and our, our time later in the month with the Ontario USO party. We're looking forward to in April. So uh, I hope everyone who is here is able to come and join us. I hope that if you, I, chatting with somebody on the air or what have you that missed our meeting, that you can let them know what's happening next month and encourage them to come as well. Because the more the merrier. The numbers is, are not an issue here for us on Zoom. With that, I'm gonna look around to any of the other um, exec board members to see if anyone has any final words before I officially adjourn our meeting. If I might just jump in. Um... You mentioned earlier the uh, Waterloo Rocketry Group. Um, they did a present. They did a Zoom presentation on their CubeSat thing. I don't know if you guys have had that already. 
but they they'll do that if you ask them. We've not seen that. Thank you. We haven't. So, like, well, I can if you send me an email, I can give you the. I can put you on to the guy who uh, arranged it here, who know who to talk to there. Okay, Jonathan, can you follow up with with Mike on that? Oh, not a problem. Okay. 